In this lesson, we're defining functions and relations parametrically. Now, firstly, what is a parameter? Well, a parameter is just some sort of factor that helps us measure something or helps us define something. Now, so far, everything that we've defined as some sort of curve on the Cartesian plane, we've defined it in terms of its x value and its y value, a series of, of dots. And we can reason that those dots are joined together by smooth curves if we make enough dots. But we can also define any curve on the Cartesian plane parametrically so that the x and the y are actually given as functions of some third variable. And it's that third variable that we call the parameter. Now a parameter that we often use is t, and I guess that's because time is quite a common parameter. And when we're given a pair of parametric equations, and they always come in pairs, because of course if we're going to define something on the Cartesian plane, then we need a rule for x in terms of t, if that's our parameter, and another rule for y. So we'll need a pair of these equations. We can often actually eliminate the parameter, the t, to get it back to being a single Cartesian equation. In other words, the normal type of equation that we're used to that just has x's and y's in it. Now, in this course, we need to be able to convert linear, so straight lines, quadratic, parabolas, and circles between parametric and Cartesian forms. So back and forth in either direction for any of those three different types. So I think the easiest way to understand this is to just look at an example. A cricket player hits a ball and its movement is noted by two people, a person directly behind the path of the ball who can only discern the movement as up and then down and finds that if y is the height of the ball and t equals time in seconds, then the ball moves according to this uh, rule here. And we can see from our knowledge of quadratic functions that this is an upside down parabola. So before we move along, let's just have a bit more of a think about this. If we were to factorise this, we could bring 5t out the front and then we would have 5t bracket negative t plus 5. So if we were then going to let y equal 0, then we'd find that this thing has got zeros at 0 and 5. So obviously at time 0, the ball is at 0 height. And at time t equals 5, after 5 seconds, it's also at 0. So it's already landed again. That tells us that if it's following something of a parabolic arc, which it must be with this formula, then it must have reached the, the maximum height or reached its zenith after two and a half seconds, because that makes sense. It's halfway between the two intercepts, zero and five. So we could look at this and work out that after two and a half seconds, it's actually going to reach a height of 31 and a quarter meters. So this person can only see the ball going up and down because they're looking from straight behind. They can't really see how far it goes along the ground. But another person who's in a helicopter that's far above they can only discern the distance of the ball from the batter because they can't really see it moving up and down. They're looking from above. And they see that the distance of that ball from the batter, we can call that x, can be defined as x equals 16t, where again t is the time in seconds. So let's think about that. We've decided from this one that the ball has a flight of five seconds. So in the beginning, when t equals zero, the ball hasn't gone anywhere. It's right on the batter or right with them. But after five seconds, it's going to be 16 times five, which is 80 meters away. And it's gonna stop very suddenly. So from up above, it's just moving along quite um, constantly and then stopping. All right, so we can understand the flight of this ball in two dimensions now, instead of just one dimension and the other dimension with a table of values. So if we list the values of T that we're interested in, and you'll see that I've gone up to five and I've looked at what's happening each second, but I've also put in a column there for two and a half because I've reasoned that that's when the ball is at its highest point. So that's a point of interest. I can then use this formula to find out what X would be at any one time. And these are just going up by 16. And I can use this formula to find out what the height of the ball would be according to the time. Now I can actually graph these X and Y coordinates, 0, 0, 16, 20, 32, 30, 40, 31 and a quarter, etc., like this over on a Cartesian plane. And that gives me something of a picture of the flight of the ball from the side. Now, what you'll notice here is that we have got a y-axis and we have got an x-axis. And each point has an x and a y coordinate. But what we can also do is actually just look at points here and label them with their t value. So that parameter t is really what's governing what's going on here. We can see what, what's happening at time equals 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 seconds. But instead of setting up a table of values, we can also use our algebraic skills and solve our two equations simultaneously. 
So call them equation one and two, and then look for the one that's easiest to get the parameter by itself. So in this case, I've picked the second one and I've rearranged it to say, let's let t equal x over 16. At that point, I can sub it into the first equation. So minus five x on 16 squared plus 25 x on 16 can be tidied up like this. And then by making a common denominator and factorizing it, I've got it into a form where I can appreciate that it is an upside down parabola and I can, by factorising, really easily see that the zeros would be when x is 0 or 80. So that tells me an upside down parabola with zeros at 0 and 80, I've got my basic shape. I can also then see that that zenith of the ball would happen, that highest point in the arc would happen at the midway point when x equals 40. Now why would you want to define any function parametrically when you could just look at the Cartesian equivalent? Well, Cartesian equivalents seem straightforward because they've just got x and y in them. And it seems sort of clunky and odd to have a parametric pair of equations that's introducing a third variable. But the time that they're really helpful is when they can convey a little bit more meaning to what's causing something else. So they'll make more sense down the track.